Give me Jesus. Oh, give me Jesus. You can't have all this world. Give me Jesus. When I I'm holding in my hand 
what you can read on our website, at least the first part of it, an article by the same title. What did Jesus know and when did he know it? I don't intend to read it to you. I may read some of it because, again, we put a lot of effort into writing things to say things precisely and cogently and dynamically. So if I see any of that stuff, I'll perhaps read it. And I'll read the first paragraph to start with. But I'm sort of going to wing it the rest of the time. And you've probably noticed, hopefully, you've noticed behind me the chart. Perhaps you are a TLTF fan and you have sat through our uh, foundational class, One Day with the Creator, in which I do a 60-minute segment in front of the chart showing from in the beginning to forever, a journey to forever. But in our shorter DVD, The End Times, which we have available in electronic form, I can, we can email it to you at no cost. I do three hours in front of the chart, cavorting wildly and explaining in more detail the Bible on one page of Scripture. And that's what this is, the Bible on one page page of scripture from the original paradise, paradise lost, to paradise regained and the everlasting kingdom. What you see right here, this is probably the most indispensable key that I know of. You gotta understand the chart. Get a chart, get a life as I am want to say. So, during the summer of 1973, corrupt political practice was on the front page of every newspaper in the United States of America. If you weren't alive then, you'll see nothing's changed. Under investigation by a special Senate subcommittee was the president himself, Richard Milhouse Nixon. He had engineered what became known as the Watergate cover-up and the committee was grilling his associates under the bright lights of the television cameras. It was under those burning Klieg lamps in front of a national television audience that then Republican Senator Howard Baker asked the now famous question, what did the president know and when did he know it? Similarly, you and I need to ask that question of the scriptures. What did Jesus know and when did he know it? And again, as I mentioned, one day with the creator and the end times has lots of information that I'm not going to have the time to unpack all of this. I'll try to point out some highlights and salient uh, points and, and so forth. But First of all, as we have said, you got to determine what standard of living you want. In other words, what will be the standard by which you live and believe and act. And I've chosen, and perhaps you have already chosen, the written word of God. Now, I've been doing this for a few years, and I've talked to lots of Christians, and of course... I'll say, how many believe the Bible is God's word? I might have a seminar in the Philippines or somewhere, and there's a hundred ministers in there. You know, how many believe it's God's word? Yes! Then I'll say, okay, how many believe then that if it is God's word, it cannot contradict itself? And then it's kind of like, yeah! And then I say, gotcha! because I then proceed to show countless apparent contradictions, which can only be resolved by understanding the inherent keys within Scripture so that it interprets itself. And as I said, that's a big one right there. 
1 Corinthians 10.32 is kind of hidden in its context of behavioral matters and glorifying God in regard to our conscience and behavioral matters like eating and drinking and so forth. But it contains a nugget that maybe a lot of people don't notice. It says, give no offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. That verse sets forth the only three kinds of people who have ever lived. Who came first of those groups? Well, let's just talk about the first guy, Adam. Was he a Christian? No, we have a very bibly live audience here, and they have answered no. Those of you at home, hopefully you answered the same thing. Was Adam a Jew? No. And now we are down to the process of elimination. He was a gent. You see it on the door sometimes in a restaurant. Gents. Okay? He was a Gentile. Means everybody except the Jews. Jews, Gentiles. Okay? There were no Gen no Jews until Abraham came along. He had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. And God called Israel out of Jacob by way of his 12 sons and the 12 tribes. So you only have one kind of person, nothing but Gentiles. Abraham was a Gentile, not a Jew, when God called him. And now we have two kinds of people. And we see over here, Jesus Christ shows up. And how many kinds of people does he find? Two, Jews and Gentiles. Now, this is critical. Which group did Jesus say he had come to address? Jews. The Jews. He said, I'm not come except to the lost sheep of the house of David. Now, we already know that, right, from the segment we read about all those verses in the Hebrew Scriptures about Jesus coming to Israel as the Messiah. The problem is they murdered him. And so what God's plan for Israel is, was held in abeyance. Here's God's plan unfolding all along. God needs time. Remember the purpose of the ages. The first Adam over here took the choke. And so God instituted plan B, but plan B took 4,000 years um, uh, to come into fruition. And so God has to work with man's choices, as we'll see. They had some flooding going on over here. And then eventually Abraham shows up in Genesis 12. Here's 2,000 years. Here's Abraham over here. And the other next 2,000 years to Jesus, the law given to Moses during that period. But the program to Israel has been held in abeyance since the Messiah who came to save Israel was murdered by them. Many people teach, as I pointed out, that God is done with Israel. You shouldn't have murdered the guy so it's all over. No, no, because here we have, I'm talking about this, you are here, by the way, time-wise, and hopefully spiritually. And if you're not, you can be any time. Just get born again. There you are on the dot, okay? And you're on the spot. And so we live here. After we are taken out, we'll talk about it, the time of great tribulation on the earth, after which Jesus Christ comes back to the earth, to Israel. And that is when we now resume our regularly scheduled program. Because right here, after Jesus was murdered, a little while after came the day of Pentecost. And that's when you were watching television then, you got that little sign, we interrupt this program to bring you a specially scheduled broadcast. And that is the parenthesis that God has inserted into his story, into history. 
This chart is titled The Administrations in Scripture. The administrations in Scripture show the different ways that God dealt with people during different periods of time. Over here, the original paradise, two people, two rules. Multiply, stay away from the tree. They didn't manage to keep them, but they kept one out of two. That wasn't good enough, okay? And so, God had to boot them out of the garden. Otherwise, as it said, if we'd read all that in Genesis, um, they could have been stuck in their death form, so to speak, in the inevitable death, we could say. And so God, once he instituted the plan, he had to pull it off without overriding anyone's free will. And I'm just kind of giving you bits and pieces here, but it's magnificent. And the point is that Jesus shows up, he finds two kinds of people. Genesis to Malachi shows all about this over to here, and from here, all of this. All of that's in Genesis to Malachi. The Genesis to Malachi shows the prophecies regarding the first coming of Jesus Christ to the earth, to Israel, fulfilled right there. Then they also show the prophecies about the second coming. They have the tribulation and then the second coming of Jesus to the earth, to Israel. Nowhere in Genesis to Malachi is there a hint of what's going on right now. A 2,000 year parenthesis, if you will, that has been inserted. One of the most stupendous verses of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Verse 8 says, had the princes of this age, some Bibles have the word world, we already know that now, right? A-I-O-N, eon, we get eon, time. One of the most stupendous verses in scripture is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You'll see three verses on the graphic, verses 6 to 8. But you'll see in verse 8 that it says, had the princes of this age is the proper translation, not world, age. We've already had that, A-I-O-N, the Greek word, eon, we get time in English. Had the princes of this age known the secret, the secret about what God had hidden up his sleeve that he planned to unveil if necessary, they would not have crucified Jesus. I don't think I've ever heard, I may have one time at the most in all my life have I ever heard any preacher talk about that verse or even raise his eyebrows or, hmm, interesting. Wait a minute. If Satan and his minions had known this secret that God was, had hidden in himself, he would have let Jesus live. That's got to be huge, and it is, and that's why God kept it hidden in himself. And this, that indispensable truth was the first thing that Satan eradicated after the death of the Apostle Paul. Even by, before the Apostle Paul died, in 2 Timothy, he says, all those in Asia have turned away from me, and when they turned away from the man speaking the truth, they turned away from the truth he spoke. And the this, this secret was buried for centuries. You can hardly find any written historical documents teaching the truth that is available today and which, of course, is the hallmark of basically 
our Bible teaching because it's the hallmark of Scripture. The book of Ephesians, which most vividly reveals this truth, is the apex of revelation to the Christian church. And the secret is that instead of just two groups of folks on the earth, Jews and Gentiles, because Jesus died, God raised him, he ascended to the right hand of God, and he poured out on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, in approximately 28 AD, he poured out the gift of Holy Spirit birthing the Christian church. You are born again of incorruptible seed and nothing can change that. You're part of the body of Christ. And so it's been 2,000 years since that time. Part of the secret is there's going to be a third group of folks. You. And the hallmark of that group would be incorruptible seed, born again, permanent salvation, filled with the gift, able to do the works that Jesus did as he walked the earth, heal people, and so forth by the power that he had put in us. Another unique feature of this administration is how it's going to end. The rapture, it's called, it's also called the gathering together. Rapture is actually not a biblical term unless you dig under the English a little bit and so forth, but we can call it that. Most people know dead Christians raised to life, living Christians changed. We all meet Jesus in the air, way up there in the air. About seven years later, we come back with him to the earth, which we read about, right? To win the battle of Armageddon, Christians return to the earth with the Lord. That's when group two gets up from the dead. Here's group one. If you're born again, you're in group one. Group one, please. Check your boarding pass. Group one. Group two is all the Old Testament saints getting up here and Jesus ushers in his millennial 1,000 year kingdom. Now, the reason that we preceded this segment with the segment about who Jesus is and who Jesus is not is because if you think Jesus is God, you can't get there from here. Because most Christians think Jesus is God. Therefore, I already showed you there were things he did not know. But he did not know the secret that God had hidden in himself. Because it says in Ephesians 3, the secret was hidden in God. Jesus is not God. Therefore, Jesus did not know this secret. And really the cool, I think, part of the secret is that Jesus, now think about this, when he got up from the dead, that moment itself is just unbelievably glorious. Think about that reunion between him and God, when God got him up from the dead, and they both said, thank you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for raising me from the dead. Then God said, let me tell you a secret, which is not going to be a secret any longer. You remember how when you were in Jerusalem and healing people and all that, you could only be one place at one time on the earth? And six blocks away, the devil was wreaking havoc and you couldn't do a thing about it. And Jesus said, yeah, that always bugged me. God, so I've got that figured out now. I'm going to make it so you can diversify yourself all over the world in a multivariegated body of believers. They'll be multilingual. They'll speak all the languages and you can infuse them with Holy Spirit that I gave you. You can pass it on to them, guaranteeing them everlasting life and helping them to live powerfully for you in this life. And Jesus said, I think, I mean, I don't have a verse, but that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. Had Satan known 
that he would be facing millions of people endued with the power of the resurrected Christ, he would have let Jesus live. He'd rather have one Jesus on the corner of 12th Street and Vine kicking his tail than a lot of folks with the same potential. And that's why the devil has worked overtime since the life of the Apostle Paul to keep the secret a secret. The secret's still a secret. Don't believe me? Stop at the nearest church in your neighborhood. Make an appointment or walk in. Hello, Reverend, hi. I, I'm just wondering, what do you think of that secret that's revealed in the church epistles? Hey, I hope he said that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. I hope that's what they'll say. I'm, I think most of them I've talked to are uh, not sure exactly what you're talking about here. It is the biggest deal in the Bible. Maybe the resurrection and so forth. So, for about 1,800 years, this secret in Rotherham's translation of the Bible, he calls it the sacred secret to delineate it from other secrets in Scripture like 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a secret. We're not all going to be sleeping, dead, but we're all going to be raised in a twinkling at the moment right there, new bodies, cha-ching. So, about 1,800 years, there's virtually nothing that you can find in the history of the Christian church. And then, in about 1830, an English-Irish gentleman named John Darby led a movement that became known as dispensationalism. And in about uh, after the turn of the century, C.I. Schofield picked up on it. And since then, there has been... Uh, a large segment of Christianity believing in what is called theologically dispensationalism, meaning that God worked in different ways at different times with different groups of people. We prefer the word administrations. The Greek word is oikonomia, oikos house, nomos law, the law of the house. It appears only nine times in Scripture. The law of the house. Okay, here's the law of the house over here. There's only two folks in the house. Multiply, stay away from the tree. Oh, gosh. Okay, then we have the administration of conscience after God booted them out of Eden. That ended with the flood. The administrations in Scripture are the record of God's righteous and resourceful responses to the free will choices of folks. That is awesome. Now, for the record, there are no signs preceding the instantaneous departure of the church, the ecclesia, the assembly of Christians, every Christian believer is going to vanish instantaneously when God tells Jesus to go to church. Then we will split. The signs talked about in Matthew 24 and 25, etc., 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 are for these folks going through hail on earth, 100 pound hailstones among some of the horrors of this time, approximately seven years. And they're going to need signs to keep going, to keep going. That's why Matthew 24, 12 says, He that endures unto the end shall be saved. Who said that? Jesus said it. Jesus cannot be talking about this administration. Why? Because he's not God. It was hidden in God. He did not know the secret. And that's where we're going to go in some fabulous, fabulous truths in Scripture. So... We must, if we want to understand the Bible, we must address, we must recognize which parts of the Bible are written to Israel, past or future, which parts of the Bible are written to Christians, present or future. 
And it's only a small percentage of Christians I've met that understand that. And that's why they're reading other people's mail. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work because it's not addressed to you. Oh, countless things. Really, if you haven't heard the other videos we have, it'll blow your mind on these things. The Sabbath day. That has nothing to do with Christianity. Tithing has nothing to do with Christianity. Water baptism has nothing to do with Christianity. It's all about Israel. And we can't live by those directives. I mean, we can try, but it, it doesn't work. So, now, given that, listen to this. Here's Genesis to Malachi. Matthew, Mark, take a look at John. Right there. Nothing in Genesis to Malachi or the four Gospels directly addresses this administration or any Christian people. Everything Jesus said up until he was raised from the dead we already know where he learned it. Genesis to Malachi. We read as much of it as we could squeeze in. He knew who he was, what was going to happen. I went through all of those things, right? What else did he know? Well, we covered all that too. He knew he would ascend to the right hand of God over here, raised from the dead, ascend to the right hand of God. What he didn't know was this. He knew their tribulation was coming. He talked about it in John 16. In, you're going to have tribulation in this world, but hang in there because I'm coming back for you. John 14, I go to prepare a place for you and come back. Nothing to do with Christianity. It's here's when he's coming back to Israel. That happens to be a part of a Jewish wedding ceremony, that particular statement and so forth. And so... Nothing in the, old, in the Old Testament, Hebrew Scriptures, Genesis to Malachi, nothing in the four Gospels, and nothing in the book of Revelation is directly addressing or speaking about Christianity. Now, there are a lot of people, maybe you already know these things, but a lot of people, what? Wait a minute, what about the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3? And Excuse me, the word church is ecclesia. has nothing to do with Christianity. It means a bunch of folks. All the language of the book of Revelation is totally Jewish, matching perfectly the language from Genesis to Revelation. I mean, Genesis to Malachi. Revelation is the bookend of Genesis and all that comes between. If you're not familiar with some of these things I'm teaching, your mind may be racing with questions, such as, as you can see in this beautiful graphic that Franco has designed, along with so many others, here are some questions. They all have the same answer. We'll make it easy for you. Isn't the church the bride of Christ referred to in the Hebrew Scriptures? Wasn't Jesus talking about Christians when he said, I will build my church? Wasn't Jesus talking to Nicodemus about being born again in John 3? Doesn't the comforter that Jesus talked about in John refer to the Holy Spirit that came on Pentecost? Isn't John 14, 1 to 3 talking about the rapture? Aren't the references in Revelation 2 and 3 to the church at Ephesus and so forth talking about Christians? None of the above. No, zero, zilch, nada, no. All, none of those questions are answered in the affirmative. And we encourage you to look into the body of work that we have done in the Living Truth Fellowship for precise, intellectually satisfying answers to these questions and many more. So we're, again, Jesus never met a Christian. He didn't have any idea about Christianity. Nothing he said in the red letters, if you have one of those Bibles, is directly referring to Christianity. 
There is a glaring contradiction created by non-dispensational thinking that is simply and elegantly explained by recognizing that not even Jesus knew the secret. Now stay with me here if this is new to you because it will make so much sense. Prerequisite to grasping that eye-opening truth is recognizing that Jesus was actually who he said he was, the Son of God and not God the Son as purported by those who believe the strange, convoluted, curious doctrine of the Trinity, which, like Mercury, cannot be grasped, primarily because it's not in the Bible. In regard to understanding what I'm about to explain, it becomes clear that, as I said before, if you think Jesus is God, there's no way that you will possibly grasp this, because then it can't be that he doesn't know everything. But watch some of the statements that he made. We're about to take a look at them in the next segment. So, beside diminishing both the love of God and the heroism of Christ, as I mentioned in the last segment, the dogged belief that Jesus is God and therefore omniscient renders many verses unintelligible. It has also, in part, led to what theologically is known as preterism, P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-M, which is the erroneous assumption that all the prophecies about Jesus' second coming to the earth, Jesus' second coming to the earth to Israel, there's Jesus' first coming to the earth to Israel, wah, that's how he sounded like when he first showed up came riding into town on a little donkey. They killed him. Not the donkey, Jesus. He's coming back here. What's he riding? A white horse. He's got a sword. Yeah, Lamb of God, Lion of Judah. Very simple. And so this strain of theology is very straining. It's straining my credibility. They purport that all the prophecies about Jesus' second coming were fulfilled in 70 A.D. This is biblically ludicrous, but this is not the time to go into all that to try to debunk it. Let's just suffice it to say that Matthew 2440 says, All the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I don't think that happened in 70 A.D. over here. Revelation 1.7 says, Every eye will see him. God will figure that out. Okay? It says like lightning goes all the way across the sky. Everybody will see him. Now, to answer the question... What? Remember the title of this? What did Jesus know? And when did he know it? So to answer the question, what did Jesus know? We need look only at what he said during his earthly ministry. Remember the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7? The meek will inherit the... Where did he get that? We already read those verses. The land, the land, Abraham, all that. Everything Jesus spoke, he got from Genesis to Malachi. Isn't that wonderful to know that? Because then we can trace these things and, and follow them as he spoke them. So he knew Genesis to Malachi flawlessly. Go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 4 in your Bible. And I'll show you this in two, two sections. Luke chapter 4. Now, Jesus shows up to Israel. These are people who for centuries, should they're supposed to have been reading Genesis to Malachi. As once Moses got it started in about 1500 B.C. when 
It was first, the first five books of the Bible were written and so forth. Then they had the scrolls. They're supposed to know this, but they didn't. So here we go. Luke chapter 4. We'll probably be in this again because we're going to read a bunch out of the Gospels. But Luke chapter 4, after the temptations, Jesus comes back and... Um, Verse 14, he returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region about there. And he taught in their synagogue, being glorified of all. Now watch this. Verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book. It's not a book like a book I've held up in this class. It's a scroll a scroll. There was delivered to him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Look what it says. This is shocking. When he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Wait a minute. Remember Isaiah? Where it's 60 some chapters. He opened the scroll like this, held on to one end of it, and just bowled out the other end. And by the way, that scroll was in Hebrew with no chapter markings, no verse markings, no punctuation. And it says he found the place where it was written. It's about 60 feet long and three feet wide. Uh, I've never seen this before. It's going to be a while. Get some coffee. Let me see <laughs> if I can possibly find this. No. He was right on it. Unbelievable. Why? Because he had mastered it. Oh, my gosh. How cool is this? And so I'll show you this from Isaiah 61 in a minute because that's where it's coming from. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Another. We didn't read that one, but this is cool. Another prophecy that Jesus, he, he knew. I'm the guy. Because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. It means spiritually poor, lacking, not financially poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them who are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Look, verse 20, and he closed up the scroll and gave it again to the minister and sat down and all the eyes of them who were in the synagogue were fastened on him. We'll, we'll do more in that chapter. But go back to Isaiah 61. Last stop here in this uh, part, part one. Isaiah 61. Isaiah, Jeremiah, here you go. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Why did Jesus stop, as we will see, in the middle of a sentence when we read this in Isaiah? Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Got it? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because Yahweh, capital L-O-R-D, has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prison to them who are bound, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. There's a comma and, maybe you don't even need the comma, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, very popular phrase, etc., etc., etc. But Jesus, standing up in the synagogue, is reading to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Arrgh! He stopped on a comma. Why? Because he knew that the day of vengeance of our God is in the future. Jesus is over here. He was fulfilling the first part of that prophecy. The second part of it is yet to be fulfilled. And Jesus knew that he had come the first time as the Lamb of God but that he would come back again to the earth, to Israel, as the Lion of Judah. So when we get into the next part of this segment, we will see what C.S. Lewis called 
the most embarrassing verse in Christianity, among other statements that Jesus made that are impossible to understand properly if we do not understand what Jesus knew and when did he know it. Stay. 